first up is Paul Gorman. And Paul Gorman, um, like two of the uh, another of uh, our speakers, is a sort of righty talky person, uh, and like me, no, no harm in that. No harm in that. And he writes about, to me, most tellingly, about the connection between music and fashion, musical and tribes. His book, The Look, Adventures in Rock and Pop Fashion. Adventures, you see. The whole idea of fashion being adventures, because it is adventures. It's very adventurous. And it's 2001, right? Came out in? Second edition, 2006. Second edition, 2006, you see. Available still was absolutely crucial in defining the way a whole world of music-driven tribal uniforms worked in Britain in the Golden Age. The Golden Age is over, of course. I've got, it's such an important book that I've got three copies at home just in case I lose one. All that aside, he's worked in the belly of the old music business beast, the music business trade papers and so forth, and he's done what you'd expect, uh, written for the face and people like that, and collaborated in a whole range of, you know, that funny hinterland uh, where art, music, and fashion get joined up and people do collaborations. He's going to talk about a very famous interior in a very famous location, King's Road, and all the big ideas and completely monstrous individuals and morphing identities it's seen from the early 70s. Paul. Thank you, Peter. Um, yes, I am going to be talking about these monstrous people who occupied this space. This is in one of its uh, manifestations. Um, but I have to give you a bit of backstory before I get there. And so this is 430 Kings Road, the address at the end of a terrace that was built in the 1870s as part of the general de property development of the area. It was established as a pawnbroker's. First of all, it was residential. And then the ground floor, which is roughly 450 square feet, was established as a pawnbroker's in the 1890s. We see it here again with the development in full flow. Um, previously, it had been occupied by the Cremorne Gardens, a place of great licentiousness, transgression and transformation. And these are all themes and uh, activities which were teased out and distilled in the place that we're going to be homing in on. Um, after the war, this was redeveloped. Uh, th these were slums which were knocked down. Uh, and after the war, the area was redeveloped into the Cremorne Estate which is still there today. And this is a vast tract of social housing. It's very important to the story because it meant that World's End, this general area, was never prey to gentrification. Um, during the mid-60s, the property reflected the fast fashion of swinging London. Um, the ground floor was first of all taken over as the 430 Boutique, a Dollybird emporium. And then a couple of years later, as Hung On You, uh, a hippie outlet operated by Michael Rainey and Jane Ormsby Gore. Um, this lasted just a couple of years, and then these two characters appeared, Tommy Roberts and Trevor Miles. And from here on in, the story of this address becomes the locus for much more than just the mere selling of clothes. Their idea was that uh, fashion could be pop art. Um, and so for the refurbishment, Roberts, who was ex-Goldsmiths, hired four recently graduated fine art students who operated a design practice called Electric Colour Company. And they saw this as a means of not only earning a few bob, but extending their own fine art practices in sculpting and painting. Work got underway, and Roberts was keen uh, that the uh, frontage should emulate his Uncle Fred's shop in Deptford in the 40s, which was an in and out store. This meant that the doors could be pulled so that the uh, frontage could be open. There was an open facade, and so there was no division between pavement and street. This was to encourage custom. And um, it meant that something very interesting was happening here once the guys from Electric Colour Company got a hold of it, as you can see here, that it's all of a piece with the fashions which were being sold there. There were also extraordinary display items, such as this seven-foot-tall, fun-fur-covered gorilla, uh, a rendition of King Kong made by the recently graduated Chelsea uh, artist Simon Haynes. He was interested in trash culture and environments. 
and he took part in the exhibition at the ICA, uh, curated by Jasha Reichart. I apologize, her name is misspelled here. And she mentioned in the um, introduction to that that around about half of students graduating at that point and young artists were far more interested in producing environmental art. This was certainly true of Simon Haynes and his wife Sue, seen here in the boardroom they created upstairs at 430 Kings Road pretty much along the same lines as the work of the then architect, obviously soon to be becoming an artist, Andrew Logan, who also participated in, uh, sit in 10 sitting rooms. Tommy Roberts exited to open Mr. Freedom on a grander scale, and Trevor Miles returned to 430 Kings Road, got um, uh, Electric Colour Company back on board, and um, for his concept of uh, a gas station kind of in the middle of nowhere, in America, so he could sell uh, bales of used denim and uh, Hawaiian shirts and vintage clothing as we, know, we now know it. Uh, Electric company, Color Company realized this exterior, part of which was this Mustang, which was customized to be uh, um, tiger stripe flocked. Um, it was, uh, again, an extraordinary environment um, which was moving away from just the sheer boutiquery of swinging London. This is 1971 by this point, and they redecorated the space in harmony with the retail concept. So with raffia matting uh, and a lot of use of bamboo, including uh, this uh, cage which hanged from the ceiling and contained a couple of birds of paradise and the oil drum counter. Paradise Garage was short-lived, lasted about five months. And by the time uh, Trevor Miles had left, um, this chap, Malcolm McLaren, recently uh, also uh, having left Goldsmiths, uh, occupied the back of the shop to sell the uh, vast number of rock and roll records that he'd, he'd acquired. He was one of Reichardt's young artists who'd forsworn trad modes of expression. And he, he wrote later, engaging in fashion seemed as artistic as anything you might do when given the opportunity to uh, occupy the whole of the building, he took over it uh, as a means of fusing his interest in what he always said was his abiding uh, uh, obsession, which was the look of music and the sound of fashion. He later said, opening the shop was an extension of my studio, like jumping into the musical end of painting. And in the back, where we see his then girlfriend, Vivian Westwood, reclining, he placed a carefully constructed recreation of what he imagined a 50s sitting room of a Wilsden teddy boy to be like. You can see how carefully it was all done. And he, he actually objected when people tried to buy stuff because it interfered with the installation as he saw it. This work was akin to contemporaries such as Dougie Field, who had turned his studio uh, not far away actually from 4.30 as the basis for a celebration in low 50s design. But McLaren wasn't interested in kitsch. He was interested in much tougher propositions. And after a year, he, he bored of the Ted's nostalgia and shifted gears into paying tribute to rocker culture. In particular, he and Westwood became interested in the fetishistic aspects of rocker apparel. And this then led them to the most astounding social and political statement that they made with this um, manifestation of 430, it was expressed as his desire to blow the lid off British sexual repression, and he achieved a synthesis between fashion design, music, and the interior. It's worth noting that the shop um, featured in the adventures of the photo kit, also known as uh, uh, Ben Kelly, our host here today. The walls were draped with flesh-colored soft latex, with fetish accoutrements and bold clothing designs in rubber, leather, nylon, vinyl, and emanating a sensual and sexually charged atmosphere which drew the clientele that he wanted. He called them the Rubber Ducky Club. I think we can guess what they got up to. The air of provocation, you know, dare you enter, let alone dare you buy or wear these clothes, was enhanced by the presence of this person, Jordan, the shop assistant, and it started to attract a much younger customer base, members of whom formed with Malcolm's, uh, Malcolm McLaren's encouragement and advice, the Sex Pistols. They were present terrorizing the audience at the ICA Fashion Forum, 
which hosted McLaren and Westwood in the spring of 1976. Now, the notoriety gained by the Sex Pistols over that year prompted a new concept. McLaren said, since we were cultural terrorists, the store had to be the ultimate punk enclave. And they looked around for an appropriate um, method of expressing this. And uh, McLaren was greatly impressed by Ben's high-tech industrial design for Paul Harris' shop in Covent Garden. With a new name, Seditionaries was installed in Sex's place in late 1976. He said, the shop had to look like a ruin. In contrast to Robert's inclusive in and out idea, Kelly's facade imposed impenetrability. It was based around stark neon, metal grills, an etched nameplate, and exposed venting. Inside, the ruin uh, idea was realized with photographic murals which adorned the walls showing scenes of devastation, such as from the aftermath of the Dresden bombings. These were sourced from the Imperial War Museum by yet another ex-art student, Simon Withers, under McLaren's direction. Harsh industrial lighting, some beaming through the jagged hole McLaren himself punched into the ceiling, was complemented by these nylon-covered adeptus chairs. And historicism for the immediate past was evoked by framed clothing from the store's recent previous incarnations. The central clothing rail displayed the subversive content to best effect. And in a way, the brutalism of the interior of seditionaries was acting out a kind of conversation with the built environment in the immediate vicinity. Seditionaries became filled with the victims of punk and tourists searching for relics, said McLaren about its later years. The collapse of the Sex Pistols and the co-option of punk by the music industry forced what was to become its final reappraisal of the space under his jurisdiction. He said, I wanted to create a pirate galleon so people felt they could now leave the King's Road. So these are the plans drawn up by Roger Burton in line with his vision for reconstructing the premises as a pirate ship ready to set sail. The exterior of World's End invoked magic and romance. We see this in the elements such as the backwards turning clock and the sketch by the architect David Connors. For the walls he chose brilliant turquoise and the floors deliberately sloped so it felt like you were on a listing ship. Maybe it was about to sink. The light bulbs were shellacked with copper to create, he said, an afterglow of a distant, romantic and exotic past. What's little known is that after a year, McLaren wanted to change the store again into this nostalgia of mud. But Westwood was already set on the path of becoming a conventional fashion designer and realized, like any sane person, that this was commercial suicide. So she, uh, so she um, called him on it, and he opened this store in the West End, which was pretty short-lived, but a very exciting place, and for another time. After showing six collections together, McLaren and Westwood split in late 1983. And 430 Kings Road has remained unchanged for decades now. There are occasional attempts to plug into the energy of the original interiors, such as here at the Met's exhibition Punk Chaos to Couture in New York a couple of years ago. Uh, somebody commented that they didn't even bother punching jagged holes in the ceiling. Um, much more successful, I think, because it was in a, it was in a, a high-end commercial fashion uh, context was was this, which uh, was the uh, backdrop for the Louis Vuitton menswear show of a couple of months ago in Paris. Even Westwood herself has paid tribute. This is um, the window display at Selfridges. So 430 Kings Road has been recently refurbished and it's been reopened to pretty much the 1981 design. I think they've taken over the basement, which uh, had always had a restaurant in there, which was a nice juxtaposition with whatever was going on upstairs, just like the Conservative Club next door. It was always a, a kind of commentary on the activities in this space. These days, it's a heritage site rather than the base for contemporary expression. 
and it's frequented by, in McLaren's words, tourists searching for relics. The clock outside turns forever backwards, apparently to a time when the address was home to more than just the activity of selling clothes. Thank you very much. <laughs>